Uh, happy Friday. Hope everybody has good weekend plans. Uh, let me start uh, with uh, just a readout of the Secretary's meetings this morning. Uh, you all heard him speak uh, following a lengthy, about 90-minute breakfast he had uh, with his counterparts uh, from uh, Canada and Mexico, but they've had bilateral meetings since then. Uh, Secretary Kerry today hosted uh, his partners from Canada and Mexico for the North American Ministerial, where the three foreign affairs secretaries discussed how to build upon the singular success of NAFTA of the, to advance North American prosperity and competitiveness, North America's leadership on energy and climate change, international engagement, and citizen security. He then held separate bilateral meetings, as I mentioned, uh, with his counterparts. Uh, Secretary Kerry and Foreign Secretary Meade recognized the progress in the U.S.-Mexico relationship over the last year and discussed how the United States and Mexico can deepen their bilateral relations and advance the agenda of the high-level economic dialogue announced by President Obama uh, and, Mexi Mexican pres and the Mexican President uh, in Mexico City on May 2nd, uh, 2013, as well as the U.S.-Mexico US Forum on Higher Education, Research, and Innovation. The Secretary and Foreign Secretary Meade discussed areas of international cooperation and also renewed their shared commitment uh, to their commitment to share responsibility for bilateral cooperation under the Merida Initiative and to work together to build a border that promotes trade and protects public safety. Secretary Kerry and Canadian Foreign Minister Baird uh, also had a bilateral meeting. They agreed to strengthen, uh, further strengthen the unique economic relationship between the United States and Canada, especially through trade facilitation under the Beyond the Border Initiative and our two countries' key roles in forging the Trans-Pacific Partnership. They also discussed the importance of U.S.-Canada cooperation in international affairs uh, to achieve shared regional and global goals. Uh, with that, go ahead, Arshad. Can we, um, can we just one quick one on Keystone sure. XL, and then if we can go to Syria. Absolutely. Did the Secretary provide any greater clarity to Foreign Minister Baird in private than he did to us in public about if and when the, or about when the U.S. Uh, government may reach a final decision on Keystone? Uh, he reiterated to uh, his counterpart that, uh, uh, to Foreign Minister Baird, that there is a process in place, uh, that that is ongoing. As he stated publicly, uh, there's a final review that needs to be released. That's the next step. Uh, he expressed an understanding that there are many stakeholders, including uh, Canada, as you heard uh, Foreign Minister Baird uh, express their support for this moving forward uh, this morning. Uh, but beyond that, I don't have any other further details for you. And then if we can go to Syria. Sure. We have a story out saying that um, Russia in recent weeks has accelerated its deliveries of supplies of military equipment to Syria, including armored vehicles, drones, guided bombs, um, just as, as you're well aware, as the Syrian government forces have been pursuing an offensive against the rebels. Mm -hmm. um, uh, do you have any reason to believe that uh, this is correct or incorrect? And if you believe it to be true, uh, what does that say about Russia's commitment to achieving a political solution that entails Assad's departure from power? Uh, well, I did see the Reuters story this morning. Uh, I don't have any independent confirmation of those reports. I did discuss uh, the report with the Secretary this morning, and uh, his view is that if these reports are true, uh, that would certainly uh, raise uh, great concerns about the role uh, that Russia is playing in continuing to enable the Assad regime of brutalizing uh, the Syrian people. Uh, now again, uh, we don't have independent confirmation of the reports. Uh, his view is also that it further, um, uh, further highlights the need to move forward with a political solution because there's no military solution to what's happening on the ground. Uh, and he also felt that um, he still believes that we are on the same page as uh, the Russians in terms of the purpose of the Syria conference, in terms of the goals at hand, uh, the desire to bring an end to uh, the suffering and put in place a process for, uh, for a transitional government. One, one small thing. First you mm -hmm. said, I have no independent confirmation. Then you said, we have no independent confirmation after you spoke about your conversation with the uh, Secretary. We, the United States government, does not have any independent confirmation okay, of this report. Okay, that's interesting. And um, do you, as of now, I think the Secretary got asked about this at one of the photo ops this morning, but do you have any clarity on which way uh, the SOC is likely to go in terms of a decision on uh, attendance? I, I don't have any uh, further update or, or uh, 
preview uh, for, to share with all of you. As you all know, it's scheduled, uh, the meeting is scheduled to convene uh, for vote today. Uh, no reason to believe that has changed at this point. Uh, we will let their process uh, move forward, and you heard the Secretary convey very clearly yesterday and again today about the importance of the SOC attending. I have a couple. Mm -hmm. um, when you said that you still believe you're on the same page and the desire to have a political transition, it does sound, though, that you believe that you're not on the same page about what a political transition means. Um, in what capacity? In, in the capacity that, you know, this, the Russians, the Syrians, you know, made quite clear in their letter to the United Nations that they're not going to discuss, and, you know, in public also, that they're not going to discuss any kind of transition that would involve Assad leaving power. So, I mean, while they say that they're committed to a political solution and a political transition, I mean, it doesn't, I'm, I'm not sure you both agree on what political transition well, I'm means. not sure unless you have seen uh, the Russians comment on the, uh, the letter. Uh, maybe they have. I have not seen the, those comments. Uh, what I was uh, referring to was the fact that there is agreement that uh, creation of a transitional government by mutual consent, which means that the parties would have to agree to who the participating bodies would be, is what the process, what would uh, the process would entail? Uh, our that's view inconsistent, though, with the Syrian regime says any political transition must include Sa Sa President Assad. You, the Syrian opposition, the rest of the international community, except for Russia and Iran, have said a political transition um, cannot involve Assad. So how, if both sides don't agree on that one key issue, how could you ever get a government? By political cons by mutual consent. Well, it's mutual consent between the Syrians, not between the United States and no, Russia. I of course, it's still important to note that the United States and Russia both agree that mutual consent is an important phrase, of course, in the Geneva Communique. So you'd have to, by the nature of having to, of both sides needing to agree, you'd have to have both sides agree in order to create a transitional governing body. We're not at that point yet. We're beginning the process, as the secretary said yesterday. Uh, this is going to be a long road, and and we're just uh, we're just starting it next week. I'm um, just one more on Arsh. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Jess. Just one more on Arshad's question sure. about the deliveries. And mm -hmm. you said, if true, you have no confirmation, but if true, would raise concerns about Russia's role. You know that Russia used to be sure um, providing weapons and and such to um, the Syrians. Have has the have the Russians said to you in recent months that they've stop doing that to cause concern if true? I mean, th would, would something I like don't this surprise have any, you? I don't have any more to is read Is it out your about. understanding, mm -hmm. is it your belief or the understanding anyway that the Russians have stopped um, weapons delivery I over don't the think last that several months? I would refer you to the Russians. I don't think that they have made a public statement to that point, but I was referring to that specific report and whether we have any independent confirmation of it. I wondered if you have any reaction to the news today that the Syrians are putting some things on the table for Geneva, such as prisoner swaps. Uh, I do. Um, we have talked about, uh, as you, uh, we're currently exploring uh, the possibility of making progress in some areas that the Secretary actually referenced a couple of days ago when he was uh, in Paris uh, in order to improve uh, the environment for negotiations. This includes improving humanitarian access, prisoner releases, and local ceasefires. Uh, I'm not going to get into, of course, uh, the specifics of these discussions or proposals, but it's an ongoing discussion. Uh, with the opposition, uh, the Russians and the UN, and we of course support progress in any of those areas. Um, I, but would it? So, but, no, well, ahead, 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 yeah. but um, you know, I think they were talking about prisoner swaps and possibly humanitarian access, but there didn't seem to be any um, offer from the Syrian regime about uh, any kind of local ceasefire at all. So um, you know, it, it's, it would seem that they're making some kind of partial, perhaps half-hearted effort to be accommodating but without going the full hog towards ending the fighting that we've seen in some of these areas? Well, we're currently exploring the possibility of making <coughs> progress in all of these areas. It doesn't mean that there's a deadline by midnight tonight we have to come to all progress that can be made. We're continuing the discussion. Uh, obviously, part of what the Secretary did this weekend was ask the Russians to play a role in uh, exerting, uh, using their influence with the Syrian regime on all of these components. Uh, so we'll continue to work on all of them. Well, does it go far enough, though, this idea of prisoner swaps? Is that, that just would seem to be a very easy thing that they could do. Well, that's one component of what we're working on. Um, it's, you know, we're exploring uh, ways to make progress in all of the areas. We're not saying one is acceptable. We're continuing to work on all of them. How, how about on a truce with Aleppo, which I think is part of the same proposals mm -hmm. that they are said to have put forward to Russia? 
Uh, and, oh, and I'm sorry, what was your question? Uh, well, about the it? question is, is whether you have any response to their proposal given to the Russians about a ceasefire in Aleppo. Is that a step in the right direction? Well, the Secretary referenced a couple of right. days ago the, the, uh, you know, the his desire to make progress on that. So uh, we're still <coughs> exploring a local ceasefire. We've, of course, seen their comments. Um, you know, there's no question that uh, implementation of this would have its challenges, but uh, you know, it would be positive. Uh, we have an openness uh, to discussing this and discussing uh, how it would be implemented. Uh, you know, but we believe um, that there's also more, certainly, that can be done, uh, more that needs to be done uh, in relation to all of these areas, and, and specifically, of course, uh, in humanitarian access. Yeah. Jen, on that, on that question um, uh, of access, though, mm -hmm. uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, said today that it's outrageous to <coughs> artificially create pretext for an intervention by cashing in on a humanitarian crisis and said they're going to counter any effort to use these humanitarian issues um, that would torpedo Geneva too. Uh, that seems to be a reference to what we're trying to help the opposition with here in terms of getting access. Uh, and so this was all an excuse to try to come up with humanitarian corridors. Are we pursuing humanitarian corridors? And, and what's your reaction to this? It doesn't seem very helpful. Uh, I'm having a hard time understanding exactly what he meant by those comments, but let me try to convey where we are with humanitarian uh, access. There have been um, over the last 24 hours, you've seen the reports, but, um, but a convoy of humanitarian assistance was delivered to uh, two regime-controlled areas uh, that have previously been hard to reach. Uh, it's important to note, and our view is that you know, there are 9.3 million people in Syria in need of emergency humanitarian assistance, and so this is a step, but there's w far more that needs to be done, even though all aid deliveries, including these, are welcome. Uh, the UN has identified uh, access uh, about uh, some high priority besieged areas uh, where um, more than 200,000 people have been trapped. Um, those include, and you've heard the Secretary talk about Iskuda quite a, a bit over the last week or two, Yarmouk, uh, Matamaya, I can never say that, and the old city of Homs, um, some of which have received aid have not received aid since last spring. So in our view, this is not a political issue. This is not an issue of sides. This is an issue of what's right, what's morally right. Um, and it should be uh, that providing access to uh, millions of innocent men, women, and children in Syria who are suffering at the hands of this uh, of this civil war is what everybody should be supportive of. I mean, he specifically said that um, all these attempts are to try to promote a humanitarian humanitarian corridors idea. Is that an idea that the U.S. is in favor of and pursuing right now? Uh, that's an idea that has been out there. What we're pursuing is what we've been talking about, which is ways to make humanitarian access available to more of the besieged areas, including the high priority uh, besieged areas identified by the United Nations. Is, it, is there anything at this point in time that leads you to believe that Geneva II may not be held? Uh, there is not. Uh, we're still working towards planning. Obviously, the, the opposition's been very active, and we're looking forward to them concluding their Suppose the opposition comes out with a statement saying we will not attend in any way, shape, or form. Will this conference go on? We are confident they will attend, uh, okay. Saeed, so, so we're working you are with that in mind. Okay, that, that, that's good. Now, let me ask you about the interpretation, since we okay. have had a great deal of time between June 30th, 2012, mm -hmm. and now on the, the kind of transition, although in your opinion, you know, it's implicit that Assad should not be part of that transition. In the opinion of a, a good portion of the Syrian people and his allies, Russia and Iran and so on, that he must be part of that uh, transition. So where, how do you reconcile? You have not made any effort to insist that this is the case, or this is the interpretation. Could I you think your question is similar to what Elise asked yeah, earlier. I'm trying to understand, to follow up on Elise's question. Okay. See what it well, is. I would point you to what the Secretary has no. said yesterday and what no. he's repeatedly said, which is no. that there's no place for Assad no. uh, in the future of Syria. Mm -hmm. uh, how this process would work, technically, would be uh, that both sides need to agree by mm -hmm. mutual consent who would be a part of a transitional governing body. Mm -hmm. We don't expect that to happen overnight, but, but that is the premise. Yeah, but but, these, but these, these, these words that he has no future, 
you know, they remind me of another statement that his days were numbered and so on, and they turned out to be a huge number, you know, I mean, he went on and on and on. It doesn't really have any kind of definitive uh, sort of frame. Well, you know, they just say he cannot be part. But what if he wants to live in Syria? Uh, well, what is significant here, Saeed, is that both sides would be sitting down okay. at the table. I, I, I just a quick follow-up. I'm so, sorry. Okay. Please. Just a quick follow-up. Suppose you have 30 or 35 percent of the public, you know, that is composed of minorities and others and so on, that actually have their faith and trust in Bashar al-Assad and like to see him run. How would you, what, you said you want to include all the Syrian people. So what would you say to them? Well, uh, I think, uh, as we've said many times, the brutal dictator who's killed more than 100,000 people uh, has no uh, future in, in, uh, in Syria. I just want to follow up on what mm -hmm. uh, Michael asked the Secretary sure. this morning, um, which the uh, whole idea of Geneva mm -hmm. was that between the time you conceived the idea and the time Geneva would happen, Assad's calculus on the ground would be changed so from a combination of pressure on the regime and support for the opposition and strengthening of the opposition that when he would go to Geneva, he would be in such a weakened state that him and his backers, whether they're in Russia or Iran or Hezbollah, or whatever, would see the benefit of a transition. But it does seem right now as if Assad's calculus has only changed to harden his resolve and to make him feel more powerful than ever. So I understand the validity of a conference where you would set a political transition, but do you think right now, um, is the right time for a conference like this when the opposition um, is is very d divided about whether to attend at all? And some people think just the whole act of going to the to the conference could weaken the opposition and further strengthen us up. Uh, we do. We absolutely feel this is the right time to have a conference. Uh, the, cer the and the reason is the alternative is horrible. Uh, and that is that there would continue to be uh, more bloodshed, there would continue to be more suffering without a political path that's uh, started to bring an end to that. Uh, so that's why we feel this is a, a essentially the right time, absolutely the right time. But to don't have this you conference. think that there should, that perhaps you want to go have a conference where you have the most chances of making progress, and maybe there needs to be actually more pressure put on the regime? before they feel so inclined to negotiate a political transition? Well, uh, as the Secretary said this morning, you have 35 countries or over 30 countries that have been invited that have a great stake in bringing an end to this conflict. And so we will see what happens next week and uh, how both sides can, uh, can, uh, can determine a path forward. Uh, but uh, there's no question we feel this is the right time and the right step uh, given the circumstances on the ground. Do we have more in Syria? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, Syria? Go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Uh, some voices in the opposition asked for uh, Geneva to, to be postponed or rescheduled. Uh, are you ready to reschedule the, the Geneva conference? Uh, no, we're not. It's scheduled to happen on January 22nd. And uh, uh, don't you worry that uh, the opposition, uh, opposition will be more divided if some of them, some of the opposition leaders uh, went to uh, Geneva without a broad agreement between the, the members of the South? Well, it's no surprise that given the challenging circumstances on the ground, there would be division among uh, members of the opposition. Uh, we've said that, uh, said that before. Uh, but what's important here is having a representative delegation uh, attend the conference, uh, sit down for uh, the first time with the regime uh, and uh, with all the stakeholders uh, in well, in broadly in attendance, and so that's why we feel it's the right time to have this conference. And last one, uh, do you consider the plan that uh, uh, Foreign Minister Mualim has presented to the Russians a Syrian plan or it's uh, a Russian-American idea? Uh, in what capacity? Regarding the ceasefire and the humanitarian aids to besieged uh, areas. Well, it matters more what you do than what you say, so uh, we I don't think we have... Uh, right of, of, of authorship on a, a ceasefire or humanitarian access, if that's something the regime and, uh, and others who, are, uh, who have the ability to make it happen are able to deliver on. Sure. You, you, said, um, you said that the opposition is scheduled to vote today on mm -hmm. whether to attend, and there is no reason at this point to expect that to um, uh, I can't remember if it's a change or slip or something, but do you have any inkling that they may not take a vote today as planned? 
No, that, that's what I was saying. Okay. I don't, okay. obviously the events are ongoing on the ground, right. so I never want to make absolute predictions, no. but uh, that's what I was conveying. Okay. I, I wonder if we could revisit the issue of the chemical weapons. Okay. Uh, today, uh, a report was published by a uh, former weapons inspector, Richard Lloyd, and uh, a current professor at MIT, uh, I think Theodore, Theodore uh, Postle, that says actually the, the, the Syrian regime did not use those the chemical weapons on August 21, 2013. Are you willing to reconsider and look at it again? Because you made a sort of irrefutable statement that the regime was behind it. That's true. We stand by that statement. So if, if this report, just pardon me, indulge me for a minute, if this report to be, you know, seems to be authentic and, and strong and sort of um, augmented by facts and so on, you will reconsider that? Uh, I don't. I think we've been very clear, backed up by significant evidence, on why we believe the and, regime uh, used chemicals. And my last question: On uh, you know, it seems that Syria and its allies, Iran and Russia, seem to be singing off the same music tape. While on the other hand, you know, you and your allies and the opposition are really you know sort of suffering from chaos, not knowing what's going on. Everybody's sort of off on their own. Could you comment on that? I would refute the notion of your question. Do we have any more Syria yeah, questions? One more, one more thing. Sure, Syria, uh, go ahead. Yeah, let me go to the mutual consent. Okay. Now, given the huge gap between the two sides, one would expect, here we go, we're going to another peace process in the region. That's mean open-ended. And if that is the case, or will be the case, what would be the purpose of the conference? Just to open the process and give it go on and on and on, since mutual consent in Syria, it is a very, very remote possibility. I hope it will, it will materialize, but it is very, very remote. Well, you are right, it's challenging, but yes, the purpose is to begin a process that doesn't currently exist to put in place a transitional governing body. Do we have any more in Syria? Yes, yes. Syria. Syria. Syria, go ahead. You mentioned uh, it's the right step at the right time regarding the Geneva conference. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> in the last few days, there are a lot of contact between uh, Secretary Kerry and uh, Foreign Minister mm -hmm. Lavrov. At this point, what are the common grounds that between Russia and US, U.S. regarding Syria? Well, the Secretary spoke to this just a couple of days ago in Paris, uh, and he conveyed that they agree uh, we need to work together to bring an end to the suffering of the Syrian people, that uh, they agree the Geneva Communique should be the basis of a conference. They agree that there's no military solution, and that's why we should put in place a political process. Uh, and they agreed also to work together on achieving some of these, uh, some of these uh, areas of progress uh, that we hope to make progress in, including ceasefires, including uh, uh, you know, the possibility of uh, prisoner swaps, including humanitarian access. So uh, those are the areas that, that they've talked about agreeing on. There are some uh, British press reports regarding uh, that the, the people, I mean, the peop uh, for, uh, Assad regime people, already they are trying to be like some kind of asylum, getting asylum either United States or Euro some European countries. Do you have any chance to see something like I, that? I haven't uh, seen those reports, uh, so I'd have to take a closer look at them. So in principle, do you agree with that? I'm not going to speculate on a report I haven't seen. Cammie? Can I just sure. On Afghanistan, there was an attack on a, a restaurant, and a number of foreigners may be among mm -hmm. the casualties. I'm just wondering if you've heard whether any Americans. Um, well, we are aware of uh, reports <coughs> of an attack on a restaurant in Kabul. We condemn, of course, the despicable act of terrorism in the strongest possible terms. All chief of mission personnel are accounted for. Uh, we are uh, learning more about the situation on the ground uh, as we speak, so I can't confirm uh, other details or other reports that have been out there. When you say all chief of mission personnel, do you mean all embassy personnel? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Uh, any more on Afghanistan just before we move on? Okay, go ahead in the back. Uh, on Nigeria, there are continued reports that as many as 38 gay men have been arrested and uh, 160 others are being pursued following passage of the anti-gay law there. It was last said the State Department was trying to confirm those reports. Any updates on that? Uh, I don't believe I have an update on the specific numbers that have been out there. Obviously, we've uh, expressed our concerns about these reports, expressed our concerns about uh, the uh, legislation uh, <coughs> as well. Um, 
Let me see if I just have anything new on here on this, on the specific numbers. Unfortunately, I don't. I'm happy to check and see if, if it, it's often difficult to confirm uh, specific numbers uh, along those lines in other countries. The Human Rights Campaign put out a statement last night calling on the State Department to use every available to, tool to demonstrate Nigeria uh, jeopardizes international standing by targeting its, its LGBT citizens. It was said before there was no talk of sanctions or loss of aid, but if that's the case, so, uh, what options are on the table? Uh, I don't have any new options to outline for you at this point. I think we've been very clear in expressing our concerns um, and, uh, and how deeply concerned we are about uh, the impact uh, all of, on all Nigerians of this law. So uh, it's also important to note that a great deal of our funding uh, goes to uh, programs including HIV, uh, HIV prevention, uh, human rights uh, programs, uh, programs that are promoting fundamental freedoms. Uh, programs of uh, funding that often goes through PEPFAR. So those are programs that obviously we continue to support, um, and I just wanted to note that uh, as you asked about our funding. And in a related topic, uh, the President of Uganda has reportedly sent back to the Parliament uh, that country's anti-homosexuality bill. Um, is the State Department aware of that? Any reaction to that? I haven't seen that. I'm happy to check with our team and see if we have more details on that. I have one. Um, I think this came up several months ago. Okay. But um, do you have anything on this former female employee at the consulate in Naples? that has uh, filed a complaint um, about rampant prostitution at the U.S. consulate, um, alleging that Donald Moore, the consul general, gave secure passcodes for the elevator to a uh, lengthy list of um, women of the night. Women of the night. Uh, the, well, we, of course, take uh, such allegations. We've certainly seen them. Uh, we take them very seriously. Uh, in light of pending litigation, we are unable to comment further on this matter, as would be standard. Can you say whether um, you're doing it, uh, your own in independent investigation? Um, I, don't have, I don't have anything on is that. Is Council happy to General Moore still in his position? I'm happy to check on the specific details what for litigation? you. I'm what, sorry? What's the litigation? Uh, well, there's a formal complaint. Right, exactly. So there's a formal there's a complaint lawsuit. and there's oh. a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. Can I go to the NSA? Sure. Um, so. Uh, President Obama laid out a number of things in his speech this morning mm -hmm. um, following the revelations from Edward Snowden. Um, he said that he was halting the spy taps of, um, which targeted friendly world leaders. Do you believe this is now going to draw a line after, uh, under this episode and do you believe this will allay the fears of uh, foreign leaders that their phones and messages are, are being uh, listened into and tapped? Well, uh, let me first say that uh, obviously the Secretary and the State Department uh, was engaged in the review that led up to the speech uh, and certainly have great support for uh, the uh, President's message uh, as we move forward. Um, Secretary thinks this is a timely, positive opportunity to strengthen the work we're doing, um, elevate and highlight our current efforts, build on our already strong uh, team of cybersecurity and Internet experts and deepen U.S. leadership on these critical emerging foreign policy issues. Uh, he'll be talking with our appropriate officials and other interested parties to determine how best to achieve this end. Uh, to, your, to your question, uh, clearly uh, we've long said that our hope uh, was that we could uh, not only work with our uh, counterparts around the world to uh, strengthen our uh, intel gathering cooperation, but to, uh, to move past this. Uh, uh, in the future, and, and that continues to be our hope. We will play a role as appropriate in implementing these uh, recommendations and announcements made by the President, and, and certainly the Secretary is supportive of, of the remarks he made today. And, and can I ask you, in, in his uh, quote, in one of his quotes, he said, we will not monitor the communications of heads of state and government of our close friends and allies. Who, who counts as a close friend and al ally? Well, I would point you, this was a speech that the President delivered that they, I know, have done an extensive briefing on and, and have a range of fact sheets, so I'd point you to them on any specific questions. But is there a, a legal definition of what is considered an ally of the United States and what is just merely a close friend? Uh, again, I would point you to the White House on any specific questions you have about the but, speech and the policy announcement. But no, but that, that, that was a more broader. That mm -hmm. was a broader question. The State well, Department must you're be involved. You're asking, in you're asking about what he meant by that, so that's why I'm pointing you to. No, that. I'm asking you if there is a uh, list, for want of a better word, of United States formal allies. Uh, well, certainly we recognize certain countries as formal allies, uh, as you referenced friends. I would point you to the White House and see if there's more they would like to lay out on that front. 
Yeah, yeah can you continue? And say, but mm -hmm. since uh, State Department handles foreign relations for the country, mm -hmm. what does what is State Department's definition of friendly or allies countries? I don't have any further definition for all of you. Obviously, our focus now is working to implement these recommendations moving forward uh, to hear uh, from our friends and allies and, and, and uh, work with them to address concerns uh, and, and brief them on, on what this will mean moving forward. But do you have a formal list of friends and allies countries or it is depends on case to case basis? I just don't think I'm going to have much more for you on this particular question. Again, uh, one more. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you do in case one of your friends, which is a key ally in fight against terrorism, the leader of that country passes on some nuclear secrets to a rogue country. I mean, so there have been instances in the past. Would, would you continue surveillance or not continue surveillance? Well, that sounds like the plot of a movie. But, no, it's uh, not. It's, it <laughs> happened in the past. It's part of uh, you, America's declassified documents. It's I'm not unknown. going to speculate on that. Uh, what the speech was about today was, uh, was laying out uh, the outcome of a review and the process for moving forward. Uh, that's what our focus is on. But do you think... But do you think this this new move would uh, reduce the tension the U.S. had with his friends and allies on this particular issue? I'm sorry, the, can you say that one more time? Um, the president's announcement today, do you think would it help in reducing the tension between U.S. and his friendly <coughs> countries? Well, uh, again, I think, as I, as I said to Joe, obviously uh, it shows the president's commitment, the review itself, uh, and the work that the interagency did on coming up with these recommendations. Uh, the president's commitment to this shows uh, the United States commitment to addressing these concerns, to uh, to uh, taking them seriously, and to uh, working to move forward, uh, given how important these issues are uh, to our friends and allies around the world. Do you think this review would ever have been undertaken had it not been for Snowden's uh, disclosures? Well, that's impossible for me to to evaluate. Why? Because it's looking back into a scenario that isn't actually the reality of what we've dealt with. You don't think that that his revelations are in large part what brought this review to uh, to happen? Hard for me to speculate on, Arshad. Obviously, the important point here is that the president undertook the review. He announced the outcome of the review today, and our focus is on moving forward. Go ahead, Joe. If he'd actually uh, briefed any of your allies on what he was going to say today, were they given a prior... The president? Yes. Uh, I, I had, you'd have to ask the White House on that. Can I have a new question? Uh-huh. Go ahead. Sure. Is there anything new that you could share with us on this topic? Uh, I don't believe so, but do you have a specific no. question? I have a specific question. The Palestinians are saying there is actually no direct Israeli-Palestinian talk that, in fact, you are negotiating on behalf of the Palestinians. Could you confirm or deny that? Uh, that has not been the case. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen those, those comments. That, okay. As you know, there have been... Uh, rounds and rounds of negotiations, but I don't have any other further update on them. Okay. Did the Secretary of State submit a proposal on the refugee issues that, based on four, uh, four options that do not include the right of return for the Palestinians? Well, uh, Said, as you know, we're working with yeah. both sides yeah. on a framework for negotiations moving forward that addresses all of the core issues, uh, but I'm not going to outline for you or predict what the outcome or what, what the final agreement would look um, like. Just on this framework, um, mm -hmm. I mean, I understand that the secretary kind of presented it, um, and is, so would you say... Would I, that's be, not actually an accurate depiction of what happened, but go ahead. Well, but I, he's working on a framework based on the ideas that he heard from both... Yes, that's right. So would it be fair to say that everyone is on the same page about the, um, not about what the ultimate framework mm -hmm. would look like, but... Um, you know, given the ideas, is everyone on the same page of, of how they move forward in terms of what he presented to them? Well, I think the way you described it is, is accurate in that it's it's working with both sides and the ideas coming from both sides. So obviously there isn't, uh, both parties haven't agreed to what the framework would look like, otherwise you would know, right? And there are clearly, as would come as no surprise to anyone, uh, pieces that each side feels strongly about. Uh, of those core issues that they're discussing. So uh, it's not it's not uh, agreed to yet, otherwise you would know. So there's not, there's not like a, a draft that would be like, let's say in brackets or something that you, Are that you agree on certain. Are passing back and forth? Yeah. Uh, no, that's not, that's not the stage we're in at this These point. These ideas that you talk about, uh, that you discuss with both sides, do they emerge in meetings that are bilateral between you and the Palestinians 
and between you and the Israelis, or are they between Palestinians and Israelis, or the three of you together? All of the above. Yeah. We've known what the core issues have been for some time, for decades, in fact. Yeah. So okay. the goal here is to address the core issues. There have been many ideas out there about how to do that, and the question is, how do we get to a point where we can have a framework for negotiations moving forward that addresses those core issues? I, I know you, you, you have addressed this in, in a few days ago on the issue of the uh, follow-up committee for the Arab Peace Initiative. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us what were the elements of these discussions for the follow-up committee and what you have seen? What did you update them on? Uh, well, we updated them on the status of the negotiations. Yeah. Since the last time they met, there wasn't a discussion about a framework. So certainly the Secretary updated them on that uh, and the process, uh, the ongoing process. And of course, part of the purpose is to hear from them as well, given the significant stake they have Was in the Was there outcome. at any point a discussion with the follow-up committee on sort of uh, re redefining the mechanism for recognizing Israel as a Jewish state? Uh, I think I've addressed this a couple times in right. terms of the rumor yeah. that yeah. we yeah. were asking to amend the Arab Peace Initiative. That's, yeah. that's incorrect. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Sure. Um, on Russia, there were these reports that the so-called Russian bin Laden, the Chechen leader Doku Umanov, um, uh, a terrorist, had been killed. Um, can you confirm that? And if not that, then perhaps more broadly, has there been any change in the level of security alert or threat that the U.S. perceives around the Olympics? Uh, there hasn't been any change or update uh, since we last talked about the security piece. As you know, we're working closely with the Russians on that. Uh, I don't have anything specifically on that report. I'm happy to check and see if there's anything we can confirm it uh, for all of you. Uh, Scott in the back. Can you go back to Nigeria for a moment? Sure. Um, this week, uh, President Jonathan sacked his, uh, all of his military chiefs. Well, I recognize that's an internal decision that's his power. Does the United States have an assessment as to how that might affect for good or ill the fight against Boko Haram uh, in which the United States participates? Uh, that is an excellent question. I don't have anything in terms of our analysis uh, here with me, but let me venture to talk to our Africa team okay. uh, and have them follow up with you on that. Uh, Joe, go ahead, and then we'll go to you next. I've got one on Myanmar. Okay. There was um, some unrest earlier this week um, in western Myanmar, up near the border with Bangladesh, in which several people, including women and children, were killed um, in an attack on the Rohingya. Um, do you have any reaction to that? Uh, well, we are deeply troubled uh, by reports of violence uh, in the Rakhine state. Uh, we're saddened to hear reports that several people have been killed, many injured, uh, at least one missing, and hundreds of civilians displaced in violence that included looting and destructions of homes and property. Uh, we're particularly disturbed by reports that security forces may have used excessive force in, uh, in perpetuating some of the violence. Uh, we strongly condemn such acts of violence which negatively, negatively impact all inhabitants and note that security forces have a particular responsibility to exercise uh, restraint and minimize violence. And as always, we of course urge the Burmese government to pursue durable solutions, including a path to citizenship that in courts incorporates uh, members of the Rohingya minority and ensuring a secure environment for displaced people to return to their homes. Have you been in contact with the authorities um, in Burma about this? Um, Have you raised your concerns directly with them? Uh, let me check on the level that that's happened. Obviously, we've done that in the past. I don't have anything in terms of recent contact, but clearly we have a, a presence on the ground. I mean, how concerned are you? We seem to get sporadically now, every few months, mm -hmm. uh, reports of a new attack involving on the Rohingya, and there's been repeated calls from by yourself and from other mm -hmm. um, people from the podium to end this. How concerned are you that, that these appeals seem to be going unheard? Well, uh, I think we, we are all familiar with the transition that uh, Burma has gone through over the past couple of years. Um, it does uh, not uh, excuse any aspect of the violence that's happening on the ground or uh, these uh, reports that I referenced here. Uh, but we're continuing to press both publicly and privately, as are many of our international partners on our concerns here, and we'll continue to do that. We are uh, uh, not giving up on the future of Burma. Uh, and. Uh, so we will, but as, as, as would be the case with any country, we will express concerns as, as, we, see, as we see fit. Mm -hmm. Could I, could I fo follow up on that? Sorry, sure. just one. Th thanks, Michelle. Um, you said something that, uh, and maybe I misunderstood or I took it, took it down wrong, but you said something about how you were particularly disturbed about reports of the uh, excessive use of violence by government forces in perpetuating the violence. 
it, that security forces may have used excessive force in perpetuating some of the violence. So that perpetuating or perpetrating or I'm sorry, I just perpetrating. Sorry. Okay. No. No. Okay. <laughs> I, f I feel how, how Joe sounds. No. <laughs> okay. no, 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 no. Sorry, perpetrating. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Long week. Uh, Jen, go ahead. The U.S. ambassador to Lebanon, David Hale, is visiting uh, Paris mm -hmm. to meet with the French officials and the former Prime Minister uh, Saad Hariri. What are the, what's the purpose of these meetings? Uh, well, uh, U.S. Ambassador uh, David Hale uh, did travel to France this morning. Uh, while there, he's scheduled to meet with former Lebanese Prime Minister Hariri as well as French officials. The meetings will focus on uh, international support for Lebanon, which, as you know, is something that uh, we are uh, deeply committed to. And what are the American views regarding the formation of new government in Lebanon? Well, as we have said, the Lebanese people deserve a government that reflects their aspirations and strengthens Lebanon's stability, sovereignty, and independence while fulfilling its international obligations. Uh, the government pro formation process is and must be a Lebanese one. Uh, as you know, the secretary had a, a bilateral meeting just a few days ago where he discussed this issue, and uh, you know we of course remain uh, remain very committed uh, to watching from the outside. But I would refer you to, of course, the government of Lebanon on on the development. And do you support the formation of a government without Hezbollah representation? Well, uh, as you know, our, our position on Hezbollah has not changed. Uh, we've long designated them as a foreign terrorist. Organization. We also designated the group in tw uh, September uh, 2012 for its uh, active support uh, of the Assad regime. Uh, we believe that the, Lebanon, Leb that the people of Lebanon deserve a government that will stand up for Lebanon's stability, sovereignty, and independence, uh, and one that will prevent the export of instability and violence from the conflict in Syria. But the government, the process of forming a government is a Lebanese process. So I would point you to them uh, on that process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have a readout about the Deputy Burns meeting with the Iraqi sure. Deputy Prime the Minister? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Deputy Secretary Burns, as part of his regular diplomatic engagement with senior Iraqi officials, met today with Iraqi Deputy Prime Minister, uh, with the Iraqi Deputy Prime Minister, to discuss bilateral issues, including the ongoing situation in Anbar Province, the upcoming elections, and our shared commitment towards a long-term partnership under the Strategic Framework Agreement. Was any part of that uh, discussion um, regarding uh, the Iraqi government seeking um, arms or increased arms supplies from the United States? Well, we've, of course, um, seen those reports in the public comments. I guess it would be a more accurate way of referring to them. Uh, certainly, we're not going to get into a laundry list of uh, FMS support. You're familiar with what we have provided, uh, the fact that we're working with Congress on pieces like Apaches. Um, in terms of whether they discuss that or not, I'm happy to see if there's more uh, detail to provide. Jen, on the also, same issue. Oh, let's just uh, finish yeah. Iraq. Go ahead. Yeah, on Iraq. Also, was there any discussion about um, the willingness for, <clears throat> excuse me, the U.S. military to train Iraqi troops in a third country? Uh, I know there have been reports of that, uh, which are, uh, I believe, referring to Jordan, which are inaccurate. Jordan, that's but, inaccurate, is it? Um, I, I, I can check and see if there's more about the meeting to read out to address your so question as well as our question. The, is the report inaccurate that the U.S. military is ready to train troops in a third country, or just the part that it might be in Jordan? Well, I don't, I don't have any more specific details for you, um, but beyond the fact that the report that has been specifically referring to Jordan and training uh, is, uh, and U.S. involvement in that is inaccurate. In the meeting with, uh, between uh, uh, Deputy Secretary Burns and uh, Dr. Salah Mutlaq, uh, is the issue of the sectarian divide come up? The reason I ask this is because Mr. Mutlaq is saying all over the place that basically the sectarian differences are irreconcilable. He's basically accusing his boss, al-Maliki, of being you know, irreformable. Uh, Let me check, uh, as I mentioned to Joe and Arshad, if there's more that we can share about uh, Deputy Secretary Burns' meeting uh, on all of your specific the, questions. The reason I ask this is because reconciliation has been really at the crux of this issue, but the United States has not taken any steps to sort of take initiative or perhaps lead the initiative on reconciliation. Uh, I think uh, we, we, the United States has done a great deal uh, to engage the Iraqi government, uh, mm -hmm. not just uh, not just providing military equipment to Iraq, but also uh, working, uh, working with uh, all parties to address, better address the needs of the Iraqi people. Uh, we've had a range of officials on the ground, including 
uh, Brett McGurk as recently as I believe a week ago. Uh, we've engaged the government closely. Uh, we've encouraged, uh, encouraged unity. Uh, repeatedly and consistently over the course of months. So I would I would just refute the notion of your question. Go ahead. Follow-up question on the statement issued earlier mm -hmm. on U.S.-Pakistan strategic dialogue. Sure. Uh, to what extent do you think Afghanistan would be an issue for discussions uh, in during the strategic dialogue? Well, it certainly is a topic of, of great interest to both the United States and Pakistan. I know as we get closer to the dialogue, I'm sure we'll have more to lay out for all of you in terms of the agenda. And was Afghanistan an issue for discussion when new Afghan a new Pakistan ambassador met Deputy Secretary Burns yesterday? Uh, let me see here. Um, <clears throat> I can give you just um, a, a readout of that. Uh, I don't have any that level of specificity, but I'm happy to certainly check. Uh, Sec uh, Deputy Secretary Burns uh, welcomed uh, the Pakistani ambassador in his new role and noted that we look forward to continuing our productive working relationship. Uh, as Foreign Secretary from 2012 to 2013, the Ambassador worked closely with the United States during a critical time in our bilateral relationship. Uh, they also reaffirmed uh, their, our shared commitment to cooperate on a full range of bilateral issues, including counterterrorism, economic and regional issues, uh, and they underscored uh, both the U.S. and Pakistan look forward to continuing their discussions during the upcoming strategic dialogue. And I will see if there's anything more specific on Afghanistan uh, to, to read out for all of you. Uh, there was a meeting in New Delhi, uh, international meeting on New Delhi on Afghanistan, where India opposed any exit clause for Afghanistan because of the so much investment the international community has made inside that country. Uh, what is your uh, latest position on BSA? Are you going to continue in Afghanistan post-2014? Uh, have you started planning for no troops inside the country? Uh, nothing has changed since we discussed this yesterday, and that is that uh, we continue to press to uh, for the Afghan uh, government to sign the BSA, uh, given how important it is for planning for the United States, for our NATO allies. Uh, and obviously, uh, as time goes on, uh, we may approach a point where we'll need to plan for, uh, for a post-2014 presence, or no post-2014 presence, uh, that it's consistently been our view. I don't have any uh, developments since yesterday. But have you identified any deadline for that? Uh, I have Weeks. nothing. I have nothing new to read out for all of you. Obviously, we have internal planning that happens, but but nothing to announce from the podium. I have a quick travel uh, schedule sure. issue. Uh, now, considering that uh, Geneva Two is on Wednesday, mm -hmm. the twenty second, Monday is a holiday. Could you give us when is the secretary likely to travel? Uh, well, if we're going to be there by Wednesday, we probably will depart on Tuesday. Okay. Sure. <coughs> I have one more on Venezuela, actually. Sure. Um, my Spanish is not as is a bit rusty, actually. But I believe that um, President Maduro on Wednesday he gave an address to the National Assembly in which he said, or seemed to hint, that uh, Venezuela might be ready to return to conversations with the United States. Has that been communicated to you? What is your understanding of that? Uh, well, we've seen the comments. Uh, whether there's been a private communication, I'd have to check on that, but we've certainly seen them. Uh, as the Secretary has repeatedly stated, the United States believes that both of our countries would be well served by a functional and productive relationship on areas of mutual interest, including those affecting citizen security, such as counter-narcotics and counter-terrorism, uh, and the commercial relationship, including energy. As you know, <coughs> just last June, I believe, if my history is serving me well here, um, the Secretary met uh, with the Foreign Minister uh, and expressed an openness and a willingness to engage. Uh, we have not closed uh, any doors uh, and we're ready to sit down uh, with Venezuela, but I don't have any announcements to make for all of you in terms of next steps. So how would this happen? Would you be waiting for a communication directly from uh, Venezuela or would Assistant Secretary uh, Jacobson perhaps I don't have any. I think these, these comments or? were just just happened over the last 24 hours, so I don't have anything new to predict for you in terms of what will happen, if it will happen, how it will happen. Uh, just that we are open to it, so we will see where we go from here. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, do you have any position on the allegations of violence against the minority Hindu community in Bangladesh? Uh, let me see if I have anything on this for you, and and if not, I'm happy to. Uh, follow up with our team, and then I'll just have to take about one more here because I have to go. Um, <clears throat> uh, so can you repeat one more time your question? Do you have any position on the allegations of violence against the minority Hindu community in Bangladesh? 
uh, sure. Well, we certainly are um, disappointed by uh, recent incidents of violence. We condemn uh, that in the strongest terms, uh, the violence from all quarters that continues to, uh, to mark uh, the prevailing political impasse. Uh, violence is not an acceptable element of the political process. We call on all to stop committing further violence. Uh, and Bangladesh's political leadership and those aspire to lead must do everything in their power to ensure law and order and refrain from supporting and uh, supporting violence, especially against minority communities, inflaming rhetoric and intimidation. Uh, so that is where we are. Okay, thank you.